of Tov. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon, and you're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. In behind me is the Temple Mount, and of course the Dome of the Rock, the abomination that sits upon it, is something that shouldn't be there. In fact, here recently I've been criticized quite a bit for making the stance for a third temple. So I thought I'd take a little time to share with you the scriptural facts regarding a third temple. Now, it's clear to us in Daniel, in chapter 9, there is a prince that shall come. And it's clear that he will stop the oblation and the sacrifice. But you have to remember, he's a false prince. He's not the anointed prince spoken of earlier, which is Mashiach, which would be cut off for the sake of the people. This prince is just a plain prince. And he comes in and he stops the sacrifices and oblation, clearly showing us that there indeed will be a third temple. In fact, let's take a look at this from a biblical standpoint. There was a scripture that I highlighted years ago, 2006, mainly because after the Lord had spoke to me and told me to read Isaiah 61, and it seemed very clear that the former desolations that God speaks about in Isaiah 61 is actually the third temple. And so I put a little marker in my Bible, and when I did, I thought to myself, I wonder where that's at. And I made a notation of that, and when I opened it, it was in Zechariah. In fact, Zechariah chapter 1 says in verse uh, 15, For I was a little angry, but they helped for the affliction. And that's the nations that came against Israel. He says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, that's Hashem, that's the divine name of God right there, the capital L-O-R-D. Thus saith the Lord, ka o Adonai, or his divine name, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercies, to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be rebuilt in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth over Jerusalem, proclaiming further, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and yet choose Jerusalem. Now, some might say, well, that was the second temple. Well, just to save that argument, let's look at another passage in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, it says here, uh, the 20th chapter, the 39th verse, that, As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Go serve every man his idols. But afterwards you will surely hearken to me and profane my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. For my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, says the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them, uh, all of them in the land serve me, where, where I will accept them. There will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your gifts, with all your holy things, I will accept you with your sweet savor, when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries in which you have been scattered. And I will be sanctified in you before the nations, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country about which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. And there you shall remember your ways and all your doings in which you have been defiled. Do you notice what he says right here? Now this is the house of Israel. After the house of Israel has been scattered and they're not even back as of yet, only very slight, small number have returned from the house of Israel. What makes up Israel today is mostly the house of Judah, which are the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and the Levites. But when it comes to, when it comes to the house of Israel, only a very tiny number has come in, but yet God has swore that he would regather Israel. So the question is, God says here in Ezekiel 20, he's speaking of this, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, so as to serve every man as idols, but afterwards you will surely hearken to me and profane my, and, and profane my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. For in my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, says the Lord God, there shall the house of Israel, all of them in the land serve me, now they're going to serve him in the land. There will I accept them and there will I require your offerings. It's interesting. 
Now, some might argue, what does that have to do when the barley harvest happened this year and we brought the first fruits up from the barley harvest, which represents the resurrection of Yeshua? Well, Ezekiel tells us in the 40th chapter, in the 41st chapter, Ezekiel goes into clear detail about the millennial temple, or at least the third temple, we might call it. And God commands that the sacrifices that would be offered and states clearly what will happen and which sacrifices are to be offered. And I know for many Christians that's been a stumbling block, especially in light of the scriptures in the book of Hebrews, where Yeshua, Yeshua entered into the Holy of Holies once and sanctified us by his own blood. And I agree with that 100%. Cleansing us from dead works. But yet we clearly see a time after Yeshua comes that there's going to be not only a temple built, but the sacrificial ordinances reestablished once again. Now the question really comes down, is it a temporal thing or not? And that's not something I could really answer. I can only tell you what the Word of God says. And even Paul in Acts 21, 30 years after Yeshua came and died and rose again, we see that he actually consents under Judaic law to be cleansed or purified. And an offering was actually sacrificed on his behalf. Now some might argue, well, it couldn't have been a, an animal sacrifice, but indeed it was. Because it's according to Numbers chapter 6. That's the very passage that they're quoting to him that he must keep that custom. And he consented to the matter. So the thing is, is in, in one light, I kind of wonder, is this, does this happen? Do the sacrifices get restored? Because when the witnesses first come on the scene, they're preaching Yeshua's Mashiach, but they don't necessarily, maybe, have, maybe they haven't all believed at the same time. I'm not really sure of the answer of that, but nonetheless, the Word of God clearly shows the temple will be there. And of course, in Daniel chapter 9, that prince that shall come, the Antichrist spirit, as we find out in 2 Thessalonians as well as in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation, by the way, in chapter 11, clearly shows the third temple being built. And nowhere does God say it's unholy. But the thing is, is we're not allowing the time for the Jewish people to recognize who Mashiach really is. And this may be why he permits those sacrifices to be offered until their eyes are open. In fact, as you begin to look at the scripture, especially in the story of Joseph, Joseph, seven years, he gathers the grain in and makes ready before the seven years of famine. But it was two years into that famine before he finally revealed himself to his brethren, although he was there all along. And maybe this is what happens when Daniel's 70th week begins. Yeshua is there. He fights. He fights in the battle of Gog and Magog. He clearly does decisive victories. He brings us to witness. They begin to testify who Mashiach really is. But isn't it interesting that Joseph all this time, he knew who they were. He knew that was his brethren. But he waited. Something we ought to think about. Not so quick to rush to judgment, but think about it. There's a reason behind all these things. And if Paul, the apostle, who wrote a great majority of the Christian Bible, the Brit Chadashah, if he offered, allowed a sacrifice to be offered on his behalf, but yet remember, none of this was to be put upon the Gentiles, only to the Jews. So you see, a lot of this has to do with our people. And this is one of the reasons why we've reached out to you guys. Because when the Gentiles were working with Joseph, the Egyptians, and the other nations, and they brought all their glory into the city, and Joseph put that aside, it was for the saving of the life of the Egyptians, but it was really meant to help Israel when their eyes were to come open. It was to feed them in a time when starvation, when famine would strike the land. This is why we need your help more than ever at this very hour. We'll be coming back to the United States here 
in the next couple of weeks or so because we have to settle the home that we have there. At the same time, we're working on getting a house here before we leave, renting a place here so that we can conduct ministry here and in the United States both. I know God has called us for a reason. I can't answer exactly what it is, how it is, when things will manifest. I talked to Mark Belts this morning. We didn't get a chance to talk much, but once before when we talked, me and Mark were talking about, based on the blood moons that he had seen and, and brought to light to the world, I asked him one day, I said, Mark, when do you think are the most significant blood moons? He said, 2015. Then we come back to Israel here in August. And all kinds of things will be going on while we're here. One of the things that we are working on, and I think it's important for you to know, especially if you're so passionate about Israel and you're finding out that you have Jewish roots, I'm working on getting in a meeting with Avi Lipkin. Avi is trying to start a, a party here in support of the minorities here, the Christians and, and other groups here that are minorities in Israel to give them a voice. I want to get a meeting with Avi Lipkin here because we want to fight for the right for the Jewish people. Whether or not they believed in Yeshua to be Mashiach or not, we want to fight for them to come home, to have a right to come home. And the reason being is because God swore that the house of Israel would also come back to this land. And the thing is, is it may be a situation where it's going to be very needful. You know, the scripture clearly says that he would send hunters out and fishers that would hunt them out, fish them out, and bring them back to the land. And I guess that's like a two-edged sword, so to speak. In one way, you could look at that as a good thing, and another thing, it could be a bad thing. Just like what we're seeing in Europe and even in the United States now, the killing of Jews, or at least the, uh, the attempt to kill Jews. I know the man that shot the people in front of the synagogue thinking they were Jews ended up not being Jewish people, but nonetheless, it's going to happen. So we need your help. By the way, I think it's fireworks in the background that we're hearing the guns go off. Yes, it is. It is Independence Day here in Israel. So I hope you enjoy the fireworks. We'll conclude with that. Like I said, we need your help now more than ever in trying to make the ministry work and to prepare a way for the Christian people that are Jewish that want to return home as well. We're wanting to eventually meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu as well to push for this. And this is one of the reasons why I'll be meeting with Avi Lipkin. So we ask that you pray for us. And if you want to be a part of this, you can contribute to IsraelReturns.com. You can still mail us in Florida at 12537 Gemstone Court, Fort Myers, Florida, 339. One, three. I think that's right. So anyhow, but we'll have our address here in Israel as well before too long, but it's still best to do it in Florida because we have a caretaker there that picks up the mail as well. God bless you. We love you. And good night.